You're listening to Parasearch Radio. News, views and reviews from the world of the paranormal from across the UK and beyond. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web. Parasearch UK Radio. Parasearch Radio, broadcasting to the UK and beyond. The views and opinions expressed by presenters and guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Parasearch Radio or its affiliates and sponsors. Listener discretion is advised. And welcome to the next of Power Show. I'm your host, Paul Rook, and tonight's show, we are going to be delving into true life behind the X-Files. Thank you, Greenaway, for that one. (laughs) Introducing Kerry Greenaway, everybody. (laughs) (laughs) Hello, okay. Yeah, I'm good. How are you? I'm fine. I thought you'd like this topic. I, I, I do, actually. I thought it was an absolutely fantastic subject. I used to love watching X Files when I was younger. In the days. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, is, it was one of those programs. I think it was like kind of a must-watch, wasn't it, for for people? Absolutely, and um, I, I, I just found it fascinating. But again, because I love some of the stories that inspired what they were, you know, what, what were in the in the books. Um, and I used to follow along with some of the real life stuff so yeah it's it absolutely fantastic mm-hmm. so yeah it, yeah it was really good I, I particularly found it really fascinating when they were doing the like standalone stories at the beginning that's what when, i preferred yeah the standalones rather than the, the whole conspiracy yeah thing. but when they started doing that every week it started to get a little bit drawn out and, and dare i say boring sometimes um and it was, and then it all became about Mulder and the whole Cedar storyline, and it, they just dragged it out for so long. And then the alien abductions that wasn't aliens at all. It was. Oh God knows! It all bit, in my view, it all went a bit far. But we're also joined in the studio, aren't we, tonight by some? Yes, we are. Um, we are joined by Ashley Neff. So hello, Ashley. Hi guys, thanks for having me. No, well, no, it's. Um, an absolute pleasure having you on. Absolutely. Did you ever get to watch all the episodes, the X Files? I, I was an avid fan of the X Files, clearly, <laughs> um, and watched it from start to finish, all, all the way through. Um, I think I missed some of the later seasons. Mulder and Scully were of it, and they had some other people. Um, I bought the re- reboot, if you like, or not the reboot, the the restart. More recently, the last two series of that as well. Yeah. I can't watch it up until one of them was abducted. Yeah, I think it was um, Scully. I, I spoiler. Know, spoiler. <laughs> spoiler alert. We need sound effects. <laughs> um, no, that, yeah, I think that's that was like the end of it. Wasn't it? And um, have they done another series since that? Um, I think there's word that there's going to be another a third a third series on top of that one as well. Oh, well, they should they should just get them back. That that'd be quite good. So I know, Kerry, you've been doing some research on some of the true stories. Do you want to kick that off? Yeah, the first one that I took a little look at was the Erlenmeyer flask. Right, Jen, I mean, we can hear you listening to the show in the background. Turn your mic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, this is a case where Mulder and Scully, the lovely Mulder and Scully, investigated the case of a woman that was full of poisonous gas. Now, this actually was based on a true story, right? A really strange one. But it happened in the 90s, so it's quite a different case. <laughs> Bear with us. I'm trying out the studio for the time. It's so good. <laughs> uh, it takes a 
have an idea with this one. I've done it. Um, yeah. <laughs> I know. Take Gremlin out tonight, I think. Um, so we, we were just talking about the case that was full of poison, a woman. Uh, the first, the first, I think, case tonight, yeah, this is the, um, the one with the woman who went into the um, uh, A&E, wasn't it, or something, and she, uh, or the, the X5 case is based on it's got, it's full of gas or something, it kills people. So they take a, um, a syringe or something from where they can take this gas or something, but it's actually based on a case, I think, that came in the 90s. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it seemed to be pneumonia that was coming out of us. Oh, right, okay, okay, cool, okay. So. Um, but it, obviously, it made, made people ill, and she apparently died a few days later. But then, I think everyone has something to be. Right. Anyway. <laughs> Sorry. Carry on. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I'm just wondering whether or not there was something in the body that caused that. Maybe, maybe there was something wrong with the bladder and it burned inside them. Yeah, like an, inter- like an internal injury or something like that that was um, causing cause an issue with inside the uh, like a, um, or maybe a um, stom- stomach acids or something that was seeping into the body or something like that, so uh, mixed or something like that. Um, I'm, I think um, uh, Kerry did manage to get to the bottom of what, what the actual problem was. Um, I don't have the details in front of me. Uh, no, that's good. You did the research. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. You can tell. It's like, I do it, and they matter. Oh, my God. Okay, right. I okay. I'm resending you the work, <laughs> and I think Gemma's muted what she needs to mute now, so I do apologise. Bear with me. We're on the background noise here. Um, yeah, <laughs> no. Apparently, apparently I've got, I've got the, the list of um, the, the chemicals that were involved in... Uh, that went into the blood when she was defibrillated, but there's so there's more letters in the alphabet. To be fair, <laughs> so, so yeah, so the, the toxicology report said that the Romeo's had large amounts of dimethyl um, sulfone in her blood and tubes. Uh, dimethyl sulfone does occur naturally in the human body and is, it breaks down certain substances. Um, once it enters the blood uh, body, um, it disappears quickly and with a half life of just three days. However, there was so much in um, Romeo's system. It's still registered at the time normal amount six weeks following her death, that is, as well. So, yeah, so she had a lot of a lot of stuff going on in her body, um, and caused a lot of issues as well. So, yeah, it's it's not something that you would expect coming out of somebody. To be fair, I mean, it, even like from my point of view, when we deal with dealing with casualties at um, like the first aid point of the whole chain of life. It's like you don't expect to come across anything like that. Not that you would, but you know, there's, there's chances that you might. Even when you're doing CPR on someone, the gas is you can get from the stomach. You know, the smell just t- um, not tastes. Smell is just awful. It hits. Um, no, cause that's, that's an- and, and that's 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 the point actually because obviously this 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 particular um, began the original case. It began when when she um, when she entered the ER, wasn't it? Um, yeah. So, well, that's, I mean, they would have put in needles and things left, right, and centre. So, whatever obviously was inside had come out, and then put in the ammonia come out and affected it, <clears throat> as it would do. Uh, yeah, yeah, like you said, even creating um, breathing problems, um, passing the passing out. Um, God, that's, that's pretty intense. It almost, it's, it's, it's strange because it, it, it almost sounds um, too too fantastic to to to, to perceive, isn't it? But obviously, it's a real. A real case, but it seems. Well, that's it. I mean, <laughs> well, it's an exile, isn't it? With, isn't it? With the mix, yeah, with, with the mixture of stuff that's actually in the body, you know, it, it's just one of those things you wouldn't normally think of, um, because normally it wouldn't be separate issues, but because obviously it was all mixed, it created that ammonia chemical, and obviously when they punctured the body, they let it all out. Um, and then it started affecting people, and they just didn't re- realise what was going on. It was a bit too late. Um, but then that's just medicine, really, for you sometimes. You know, you can sometimes treat the easiest of things, but then it becomes more complicated as time goes on. But this doesn't happen very often, does it? I mean, like, this is, like, I think, the only case of this particular situation. 
that's what I mean. It, it, it's so rare that you, you wouldn't normally think of it. No. But True. everybody's different, and you know, when, when obviously you're doing your medical training and stuff, they teach you how to deal with each problem as it comes up. So it's a separate issue. But then when you get mixed issues, it then becomes a bit more of a bit more tricky to deal with. Mm. Um, and because this isn't something that normally gets, you know, it's just out of the norm. Completely uh, out of the norm. It's, it's not covered. So they just come across this issue um, without realising what's going on. So they just would have had to deal with it there and then. Um, yeah. What's, what's weird though, that it, right, they, they, they said that the, uh, the, reason she, the reason she died was due to heart failure. Um, uh, kidney failure brought by late stage cervical cancer, which mm. uh, all horrible things, but they sound relatively normal. You don't expect them to have a, a LinkedIn with this whole toxic lady situation. No, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, uh, that's that's just it. I mean, it it might have even had nothing to do with that cancer issue either. No. What was interesting, though, is the, the levels, wasn't it? I think that was the problem. The levels of the dimethyl sulfone That's right. in her blood. Um, I, I, when I was looking into this, it, it breaks down certain substances in the body, right? But it disappears quickly. It only has a life of, like, three days or half yeah. life of three yeah, days. Yeah, half life of three days, yeah. But she still registered three times the normal amount six weeks following her death. That's pretty extreme, isn't it? That's extreme case. It is. But so if that that was like six weeks after her death, how much of that did she have in her body? That must have been. It must no, have been. No, I thought she was ill. Yeah. <laughs> Makes really? you wonder whether she was injected with something in the first place to create that. Mm. What was it? Also, sounds like a has has team at the at the situation. That she put her body in the sealed aluminium casket as well, so mm. or, or aluminium casket if you're American. And they did three three autopsies on this poor woman. Three autopsies. Yeah, yeah, yeah she did. Yeah. I wonder if she went through different um, people that done the autopsies. Because <laughs> he didn't know what. So he like, probably was right. You're probably dead right. They didn't have a clue what was going on, so they passed it on to somebody else to do another one and another one and another one. And I thought, oh, well. It's a bit work in the UK. But <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe, you know, they, they would have just, obviously, when when the patient died in the ER, um, they would have taken it down to the morgue, and that's where they'd done the autopsy. So the first person doing the autopsy probably wouldn't have any idea whatsoever other than what happened in the ER. <clears throat> so, you know, would he have been... Protected up, gas mask and everything. I don't know. Be interesting to find out. Well, as much as I could find out on that one, to be fair. No. <laughs> I like the next one. I like the next one that we're going to talk about. <laughs> I okay. thought this was awesome. Right? Now, the episode was called Home. Mm -hmm. And it was yep. a fame. It was quite a famous episode because some of the networks actually refused to air it because the episode itself dealt with issues of incest abuse in a small Pennsylvania town. Now, the actual episode itself was completely fictional, but it was based on the Ward family. Now, what's notable about the Ward family is there were four brothers, and they were like basically a bit backwards in life really they were quite you know little farms there they were illiterate they weren't very sociable pardon low IQs apparently that's what yeah. you can search it does I was trying to like not be direct so I was trying to you know, mix it up a little <laughs> yeah but <laughs> and basically one of the brothers the eldest brother was found dead one morning and basically the brother that slept with him got accused of murder and was arrested all right so delbert is his name who got arrested um yeah allegedly confessed to the crime he, he signed a statement of guilt but the, the whole thing was, well, how could he when he's illiterate? How could he read it and sign it? 
because he's completely illiterate. So it was a massive court case, this one. Now, I love this. These guys, these four brothers, lived on a farm, a 100-acre farm. This isn't a small holding. This is quite a big farm, right? And yeah, they raised, really yeah. yeah, they raised chickens, pigs, a herd of 30 dairy cattle. That's quite a good size. <laughs> It's quite a good size. So they, you can sort of see why they're quite remote bakers, at the day. Yeah. But Bill, before he died, was moaning and groaning. Um, it, but he'd lost weight. He was having a lot of pain. And then to his brother that he felt like someone was putting a knife through his, like his head. And he would he'd taken to just swallowing handfuls of aspirin to try and relieve this pain. Um, it didn't really go to sort of like the self-medicating with aspirin. Anyway, when he didn't wake up one morning, he died. She was following him in the sleep. And what they said was that um, he had actually suffocated his brother to end his brother's suffering. Now, this guy was facing 15 years to life in a state prison if he was found guilty. Mm -hmm. And it was purely hinged on this document that he allegedly signed, it's confessing. Great. Yeah, which he couldn't read, confessing murder. So, and even on the defence stand, he said, why would I want to kill him? He was my best brother. I bet the other two weren't too happy about that statement. <laughs> oh, really? Well, he did sleep with him too, so. Well, you know. <laughs> now, the, the actual, because it's such a community, a good, feel-good community story, this one. Um, the community actually rallied to Delbert's defence and raised lots of money to, to give him a good chance in court of law. And it really hit the media over America. And even had a documentary film. Yeah. Yeah. Throughout yep. all of this. And the jury took nine hours of deliberation and they came up not guilty. And then after that, he became like a bit of a mini three, didn't he, old Delbert? <laughs> I, I can imagine. Well, he's, he's avoided, avoided the jail because that was happening. There was, it seemed like coercion, doesn't it? Because obviously, they said, like, you just signed this, which obviously did. Well, that's it, yeah. Wrote, wrote it out for him and got his ex on him. He must have been incredibly bewildered by the whole process, though. Do you if, not think? If he comes from a farm like that, then, then the other the other thing I suppose you've got to look at if their if their their world is that farm and they don't they don't venture very far from that on a regular basis, then then yeah, they're they're they're, they're quite isolated away from the, um, normality. So when something like this hits, it would be it would be really really overwhelming thought for these kind of yeah. guys. Do you yeah. remember the film Nell? Bailey. <laughs> Again, I've not seen that one. It was basically like um, Jodie Foster it was brought up by her grandmother in the woods and her sister. And um, she had no she hadn't been involved in society at all. She'd lived literally purely and simply in this house. And she's so silly. And the reason is because her grandmother who raised her had hair lip and couldn't speak properly. So she was she learned language by what, she, what she'd been taught, basically, which was to speak by her grandmother. And they what they tried to do was socialise her. And her journey through that, basically, I mean, there's a whole her sister's death and that shit going on as well. Really great film, but it really sort of like reminded me of this case with Delbert and his brothers, of how overwhelming the whole scenario of coming into that much focus from mm. people, um, how much it could have been. He seemed to take it in his stride, though, to be fair, because um, they, they did a lot of celebrating after the court case um and the local community were well you know well pleased they were shaking in my hands and everything but when the film they did a film called brother's keeper this documentary film um and this was profiled on some very high profile shows like cnn maury povich show whoever he is yep. Yep. um inside people's magazine yep not inside people's magazine, but inside <laughs> People's Magazine. Yeah. <laughs> you know, grammar. It really helps sometimes. And, and they stayed at a really posh hotel as well. That must be an experience for them. Completely Yeah. I mean, it's bad enough going to a hotel and we know that it's quite social. Do you know what I mean? We still get overwhelmed. You go to the void or something, you feel a bit like, oh, you know, what do I do? What's the again? But these blokes are just, they stick all in their stride. And I, I love that. And they won the 1992 Sundance Film Festival Award. Yeah, the Audience Award, yeah. yeah. Mm. yeah. It does make me wonder how many law enforcement places there are that are a bit like that corrupt. They think they've got the right person, and they haven't. And they make it, well, not sort of make it up, but 
Philip Gass or something. Jessica. Yeah. I see. I see a certain amount of irony in it. It's like the, 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 guy, the guys in the farm are kind of labelled as, as having low IQs and stuff. Like that. And but obviously, <laughs> without sounding too complete, they've obviously they've obviously gone in there and got an open showcase without looking at yeah. the entirety of the evidence. Mm. And, and obviously, because he sleeps within it, it must have, it must have been him. Um, and either they've tried to coerce coerce that 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 confession, or that's what they believed happened, and they just they got him just to sign that sign it off as that's what happened, or the element of questioning made them think that was the answer. So it's yeah, it's, it's it's a it's the irony being that obviously they weren't they weren't they weren't as bright as they should have been with the case and looked at all the evidence and all the possibilities for the situation. In the end, they were the ones that made it look a bit like the egg on their face because obviously it went through court and he was found not guilty. Yeah. I would say he probably just died of an overdose if he was popping aspirin like that. I was thinking that reading that. I'm pretty sure from reading things before, I'm pretty sure that aspirin and just chucking handfuls of aspirin down your throat on a daily basis or multiple times a day is probably... Yeah. No, isn't, that, isn't it aspirin that never leaves your system? Um, aspirin thins your blood. And if you've got any, like, stuck and cold... Knife to his stomach. It, yeah. Yeah, it was a I don't find any records on that. It just seemed like the police just went for a murder, but I couldn't find any of like the um, district attorney records or anything like that, which would have outlined the medical steps that were taken post death. Because surely, if they'd done a post mortem and found that that that's how he died, not just by suffocation, you would have closed the case. Anyway. But uh, I think you've gone in there with the view that it was right from the beginning. They might not have gone for the whole autopsy thing. They might, as Ashley said, might just thought they've had the right man from the beginning and got the signed confession, so there's no need for an autopsy. Yeah. Because it all costs money at the end of the day, especially in America. Um, it could be why, why But this was the 1990s. This case was the 1990s. It's not far back. Not really. No, no, but if Tom's not doing that well, then they might not have a medical insurance. And there's people out in America that... I don't know, cut their fingers off accidentally and have to choose which one they have put back on because they can't afford it. Cheapers, really? It's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, yeah, if you haven't got medical insurance and if the farm weren't doing that good, it, it puts a lot of people off going to the doctors in the first place. Mm, which is probably why, why, why he's laying in bed. Yeah, why he's laying in bed. 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 Why because you're not social. So I suppose it's one of those you just put up with it and get it. Mm. Yeah. Possibly. I don't know. But as I said, I didn't find a record of an autopsy or anything. So it does it does surprise me that wasn't a step done, regardless of medical insurance or anything. That would have been pre-death. But post-death, it was, that step wasn't done because that would have just blown the gun. Not done. Possibly, you know. Anyway. I, do you know what? I don't even remember that episode, to be honest. I, I do. <laughs> I'll take a top off, Ashley, in that one. <laughs> Not in that one. I <laughs> <laughs> tell you. I never remember. <laughs> <laughs> now, that was this iconic image. Everybody is a normal. So well known. It is about the Viking 1 spacecraft that off of um, a human face on the on the surface of Mars. Yeah, yeah, I've seen that picture. It's in my book. <laughs> so my book that I was talking about Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a very iconic guy. So I think we all know that photograph without me even having to show people that photograph. Um, yeah. we all, it, it's a well-known face and people have used it as many conspiracy theories about this particular face and it was part of this episode. Now, um, I have to say... I love this because I, I actually went to a NASA site for, for an explanation of, of what this, this one was. And it's great. I, I have to say, it, it, it's quite humorous the way it was written um, because it, it goes, there must have been a degree of surprise amongst the mission controllers back at Jet Propulsion Lab <laughs> when the face on their monitors. And you can always see it, can't you? Go, what's that? <laughs> you can imagine if it was a British one and go, oh yeah, and move on. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I can imagine they'd all go, wow, look at that. <laughs> Paradonia, I think. <laughs> Either that was Marvin. Yeah, yeah I doubt he was Marvin. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> no, definitely Paradolia, this one, isn't it? <laughs> Incredibly, yeah, but... Paradolia, but I tell you what makes this interesting is that NASA, when they unveiled this, um, the caption said, huge rock formation which resembles a human head, right? It was a good way to engage the public and attract attention to the work they were doing in regards to Mars and Viking Viking were doing. So they've used it almost as a media... I know, I know. NASA, since, since the shuttle program finished, NASA's kind of been dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping, hasn't it? And, and things like this, they start they started using things like this as like captions to like bring people back to NASA, see what they, the work they're still doing and stuff like that with Mars. And back then, obviously, the thinking of of Mars preparing to, to drop a, a rover on there and all that. Yeah, started off with huge rock formation. Then there was a human head, and then the reason it was human head, by the way, <laughs> some shadows giving the illusion of nose and mouth. <laughs> it resembles the head. So come and have a look. <laughs> Even Wait. now, they see it in the headlines. Often yeah. back into the headlines. Often. Yeah, a couple of months ago, that one of their um, space satellites has joined the system. So yes. it's literally in interstellar space, travelling towards another solar system. Right. Uh, Two actually. Yeah, and and then they've found another planet that's nine times the size of Earth, but exactly the same as us. So there are people on that one. Well, I don't know. I mean, I don't know whether it's that far evolved. I don't know. Hey, Jim, uh, if we can't find a man on this one, we chances are we might find one on that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's still being they, they, found, <laughs> but they heard some you know, signals come from another galaxy as well, wasn't it? As, that was another recent... Yes, yeah, I saw that on 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 the social web and the internet and the internet. Yeah, on the internet. <laughs> yeah, um, but I mean, re- reading what they what they discovered, it, it was like a very short couple of seconds burst of radio signal, but it was very um, it was it was timed perfectly um, in in the pulses or something. I don't know, but. I, I thought maybe it could have been a, a pulsar or something that sent it, but there's loads of different explanations for it. Ah, there was boys, isn't there? No, yeah. you're oh, talk now, right? Now, right? You've gone off into somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Pulling you back. back. X-Files, back. Back. true stories. X-Files, yeah. Back. yeah. <laughs> out there anyway, if he's out there, apparently. And it's a formation, everybody. The head on Mars, it's just a... Same as the pyramids. That's supposed to be on Mars, and no, I don't believe we have a base up on Mars where Barack Obama got Not up there and aggressed. And <laughs> now there's a show. there's a conspiracy theory. <laughs> I think it's only a matter of time before we have some Mars. Oh, it looks like it's going in that direction. They can't even build on the moon, that alone. Mars. So that, that, I, I reckon that's going to be their next. Step something on the moon and then as soon as they've got that because it's easier to take off from the moon than anywhere else well funnily enough before we dive me about the new hadron collider that they've been in the super big one yep it actually been... not that well, one okay. but another one the other day the japanese dance on them what mm. <laughs> yep <Yeah. laughs> yeah. god they Any... missions as well same barry okay it's far now well, the infamous investigators spent a considerable amount of time interviewing and investigating the case of a guy called Dwayne Barry. Now, in the, in the episode, he believed he was abducted by aliens, don't they? A medical doctor, Scully, because she was a medical doctor, wasn't she, um, discovers that his front lobe was damaged by a gunshot wound decades earlier, which explains Barry's odd behaviour and his beliefs. Right now, this actually was. Oh, I love this story. No, that's the wrong term. I didn't love it. I, it, interest, it was interesting. Um, <laughs> um, it was. I oh, know, right? A little twisty of mind going here. And it was actually taken from a case um, of a guy called Phineas Gage. And this is a man who survived being impaled by a railroad spike. And he had an entire personality shift. Did that. Now, he's 98, and Gage was 25. He was a foreman of a crew cutting a railroad bed in Vermont. Now, he was using a tamping iron to pack explosive powder into a hole. The powder detonated, the tamping iron... Oh, right. Oh, everybody, cringe moment. Cringe moment. 
43 inches long, weighing 25 inches in diameter and weighing 13.25 pounds. Ow. Penetrated Gage's left cheek, ripped through his brain and exited through his skull. Good song. I would say it's down a little bit. Uh, he was blinded in his left eye, and he, but he didn't lose consciousness, actually. He, he told the doctor, here is business enough for you. <laughs> when he got to in. Okay. Sense of humour, good work. Yeah, you know, sense of humour. But what it did was he actually had a huge shift in personality. Yeah. He, he, had, he had trouble sticking to plans. He used to utter the grossest profanity, which, you know, I suppose now it probably would be quite normal. Um, yeah. And didn't really have empathy for his other, you know, other people that he knew. Um, so they sacked it. They, had, they couldn't take him back when he was, like, fit for work. They couldn't take him back because of this personality shift. Um, and he died in 1960 after a series of seizures. Now, this one's quite interesting to me because it made me think of lobotomies. Yes. Yeah. Uh, mental illness and patients. So I went on a little tangent. We went off yeah. in a little tangent. <laughs> That's what we went. <laughs> what you tell me? Um, on its very basic level, from what I understand from briefly reading about it, I don't know it, but it's physical... Uh, operation to try and fix a cycle loop within in the brain. So basically, they might take away part of your brain in order to fix a psychological issue, or do something physically to your brain in order to fix a psychological issue. Doesn't make it my my mind. So it's like a bit like um, so like with Gage's situation, they took <laughs> his accident took away part. Obviously, changed his personality and his behaviour structure because there's parts of the brain where he had developed those previously. Sense. I think a couple of other cases more recently that similar to this as well. Yeah, what what they what is basically like different parts of the body personality trait. So they know obviously where your memory center is. So all your memories obviously go there. And basically, what they do is just cut away some of that and fix you. Um, and yeah, 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 sometimes it would have worked, but then sometimes it went horrible. <laughs> I get I get vision about Hammer horror films and things like that come to mind when you talk about things like this for some reason. Like, oh, yeah, house, was, house exactly. and Haunted Hill and all that kind of stuff. It, it was, um, uh, the letter that comes to mind when he <laughs> cut their blood out. And oh, lovely. In front of him. And that's not, what's not, mine. Yeah. Me. <laughs> but, but yeah, no, on, on a suicide, I'm pretty sure, I mean, I, I, I haven't, I don't check it, but I'm pretty sure there's some, but has been some more recent cases, obviously not as, <laughs> not as cut in, probably the wrong term, as gauging, um, but they've got, where they've lost a part of their brain and they've managed to carry on with normal life, but they had either memory issues or behavioural changes due to losing a part of that brain. Yeah, and I mean, sometimes it's not even, you know, even if someone gets any head trauma um, and, and just bangs on the head and things, they, they just change. It just damages that part of the brain. Um, there was a very quiet recent last few years or so, um, where the guy, I can't remember what he was doing, but he, he had like a head injury um, at work. And when he woke up the next day, he had changed. Basically, he woke up gay. That's where that story was going. Mm. Um, and yeah, it, it just changed his whole personality. It was really strange. Because I remember then having a debate with uh, a few gay friends that I know about this story. And they took like quite exception to it. Yeah, I can imagine they did. That's awful. Awful that he was gay. It's awful that the suggestion is that there's something neurologically wrong that makes you that way. Well, that's sort of what what I was saying. I was like, well, I don't know. I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I've got no nothing against people that are gay. I, I've got friends that like that, and you know what, what they want to do as long as they're happy. That's fine. You know, I haven't got a problem with that. But it, it just sort of raised that debate, and I thought, do you know what, well, that is quite an interesting subject to talk about. Um, and yeah, no, it was, it was good, good conversation. <laughs> good, good that. I think what's interesting about this one, and I'm going to change the thing, is um, there is photographs of Phineas Gage out on the internet, and it's, yeah. you can see quite a handsome man back into deer, if you like that kind of look, you know. <clears throat> but there's no photograph of him until recently. 
they, it was developed. It was in ownership of Apple that had the photograph. They didn't realise what they had, and then it was then they sort of put it out to try and work out who it was. But they found out it was the only surviving photograph of Phineas Gage. Interesting. Well, I quite okay. like that. Yeah. Um, now it it makes me wonder how these researchers and how they, you know, wrote the episode. Yeah, well, this one, the Warren and Anatomy and Anatomical, that's Anatomical Museum. <laughs> actually, they've actually got a life mask taken of Gage's head when he was alive and the iron that pierced his head. There is the art that the museum have. Yeah, I'll bet. By, by students, which is, which is crazy. Shannon's with us. How <laughs> um, they managed to work out the photograph was him because the. Um, <laughs> the scars perfectly match up with the scars in the photograph, if that makes sense. So that's what they knew. It was the photograph, the gauge. Was, the photograph was after yes. the incident. Yes. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. It's actually quite a good clarity in the photograph as well. So thank you to the Research Digest for that comment. I'll, I'll look at that one. Uh-huh. It, it, honestly, it's fascinating. So, yeah, I found that one really fascinating. Cool. Yeah, I did too. <laughs> So we're going into the realms of serial killers next. Ooh, okay. Uh -huh. right. This one was an episode called Irresistible. Uh, and actually, this is quite relevant because there's a TV set or a Netflix series coming up um, very soon about this guy, I believe. I could be wrong. It might be a different serial killer. I think it's the same guy. Uh, now, Scott was dealing with this case of a serial killer named Donnie Faster. Um, now, the character was originally written as an acrophiliac, um, but they wouldn't air that episode because it's quite extreme. But the character was based on Jeffrey Dahmer. Oh, I've, I've heard of Jeffrey Dahmer. It is the Netflix coming up, isn't it? I think you might be right. I'm not going yeah. <laughs> to... But i tell you why, because when I... Oh, I bet that's interesting. Now, this is shape-shifting more than anything else in the episode, um, but Jeffrey Dahmer, his um, hostages reported that apparently he shape-shifted, his, his appearance changed once they sort of met him, but I was sometimes wonder if that's just true character coming through. So like when he, you meet somebody, you have a facade, don't you, that you put on for people, and then they got them under his control, he could let that facade slip. So I'm wondering, rather than shape-shifting, it was more of a, his true character is coming through. Um, that, I, that's my opinion. But somebody else, I'm sure I remember that he had piercing blue eyes. And then, uh, but was reported that his eyes went back when he was in that mode of killing. Could be some spell. Yeah. Popular Jeffrey Dharma. Um, in depth, but he was an American serial killer. He was born in 1970, and um, in 1978 to 91, he met 17 males. Um, and cannibalism were all parts of his modus operandi. Lovely man. Yes. <laughs> nice one to meet in the day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> now, although in childhood, when up, he actually withdrew and um, uncommunicative. Um, he showed very interesting hobbies or social interaction. Um, and turned aesthetically to biology, which was like examining animal carcasses and stuff like that, and was a heavy drinker as well. He was incredibly intelligent. That's one thing that did come through um, when I was researching. It, he gradually perfect no problem at all. He was probably an alcoholic by this time. It's a common, commonality, isn't it, with um, serial killers to be quite intelligent, that, that, that sort of thing, to be quite charming and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, uh, enigmatic mm. people. It's almost a bit. These kind of characters remind cult leaders, yes. like, like the other guy who managed to kill a million people or convince them to kill themselves. Um, so can, yeah, can the way, the way, the way, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, that must be such a force of personality to be able to do that. I can't influence no one, me. I tell you. It's almost, it's almost, like, almost like, like people whispering. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, or a pure, pure form of narcissism, how you can um, make someone change their and become completely under their control, which is basically how narcissists control their partner, isn't it? Through that kind of yeah. control. But it's on a grander scale um, and done a lot on a really shorter 
time frame because three weeks after he graduated, he committed his first murder. Wow. They blamed it on his divorce. That was nice of them, wasn't it? Yeah. They always blame the parents and see it done. Mm hmm. And he just nicked a hitchhiker, Stephen, his name was. Um, and basically, they were going to go and just drink beer. Um, and then, when Hicks decides to leave, then Dharma hit him on the back of the head with a £10 dumbbell. He then dissected, dissolved, pulverised, and scattered the remains throughout the backyard. And then basically, he said, kill him because he didn't want him to go. Fair enough. <laughs> He liked his company maybe, that maybe night. Maybe it was his round. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, he waited nine years before he killed again. Again, that's that ability, that, that ability to kind of sit and wait and, and all that. Also, um, uh, something comes into, into like, the, like the Kodiak killer and like... Um, the Zodiac Killer, not the Kodiak mm. Killer. <laughs> it's okay. The Zodiac Killer is all that. The ability to wait so many so they don't, they, so they fall under a little bit, stuff like that. Or the first killing is one. He obviously got to the point where he wanted that euphoria again and went for it again. Maybe just so. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. He obviously, he obviously, gets, I'd say, great um, from examining animals and stuff like that. And perhaps there was at some point he was, was a, like a little cruelty to animals or something like that. And from that point, done to into killing people. The biology and the natural progression, I suppose. It comes through that affected him and then rise and scatter yeah. his remains really hard. I mean, that's quite extreme. For a serial killer, they normally aim sort of, maybe, but he didn't. He, um, in 1985, I mean, he was drinking really heavy, so by now his alcoholism is like really wrapped right up um, through, you know, all sorts of things. Um, and then went to live with his grandmother because he was uncontrollable. So good old Renny stepped in and went, I'll take care of him. Well, he was visiting gay bathhouses then, and where he would just drug men and rape them as they lay unconscious. He was arrested twice for incidences of indecent exposure, but only faced promotion. He wasn't charged for the rapes. But then I think sometimes that's social um, standards on that one. They would have got, you know, it's gay rape not. Back in the 80s, this was 82 and 86, where he was actually arrested, um, the cultural viewpoint of um yeah i know you're going <laughs> you, yeah you could be trying to say it it was sort of like rather than looking at it, it happened and have to go through trial and all that mm. it kind of swept under the carpet or left left alone sort of thing yeah um, or maybe just wasn't dealt as seriously as in like a, a man raping a, a woman but even back in the 80s i don't think that was taken as seriously we kind of view things from our snapshot of what we you know, of, of today's viewpoint on it, and it, that's not what it was like in the eighties. You know, yes, yes. it really wasn't acceptable um, behaviour, and so you know, rape and things like that. There was a lot of blame put on the victim rather than the perpetrator and stuff like that. But I don't know. Anyway, he then um, after that little instance, he picked his second killing victim. You know, to kill, uh, picked him up, took him to a hotel room and um, beat him to death, basically. But he says he has no memory of actually murdering it, but alcohol can do that, can't it? If you're a heavy drinker, you have yeah. black spots in you. Yeah, yeah. And so when he's black out and committing these crimes... I think that's just a psychological question. It's not, it's not alcoholism that's doing that. So he, he switch, it almost switches personality at the time. It's the right personality. When he, when he gets, mm. the, the, drinking could be, the, the, kid, the drinking part could actually be... Um, what well, he's he he's um, I'm trying to think of the right word now. Not subsidising. Um, it's all like it, he he's balancing his personality using the drink because it keeps the other half of him at bay, so to speak. Mm. So it's so like, like, like Jack and Wyatt kind of thing. A little, a little. Yeah, I mean he had to one in eighty nineteen ninety, yeah, and he was and he was pissed or using prostitutes, um, male prostitutes, obviously in the brain strain. But then it took another level. He, he escalated further. Um, after, now this is quite gross, I would just like to say this, um, after the person, he'd killed the person, he then needed to use his first intercourse, a like dismemberment process, and then started preserving, now this is trophy, isn't it? Trophy, um, yeah, serial killers. Yeah, serial killers. Like, like don't they? So, like, um, victim skulls and genitals. Also, it's also linking back into that fascination with biology that he originally had back, in, back at the beginning of the story as well. And like you said, he's, he's, con he's containing those as, as trophies and elements like that as well. And retaining parts for consumption. He was 
child and the amount of time and he's got. Because I've your research, he's got a total of things, and he was mm-hmm. sentenced to lifetimes for offering. So he's, he's serving 957 years in prison. Yeah. And when he um, pleaded guilty for the Stephen Hicks one, mm-hmm. he received an additional life sentence. So I think it's a bit of mental stability or unstable mental ability. Um, I think he escaped the death penalty. I was wondering that at the time. I know he's dead now, but I did wonder why he escaped the death penalty. Depends not, on I was going to say, it, it does depend on the... It's not across the whole of America, no. is it? It's only certain states yeah. that have right. death penalty. Um, so... Uh, Wisconsin. Yeah, so it might it might be. I, mean, I, don't, I don't I don't know, but I mean it might be that it's not the death penalty at the time. There wasn't a, there wasn't a death penalty in Wisconsin at mm-hmm. the time. So, um, but you think would you wouldn't get the death penalty? All, all the all the evidence wasn't enough for the death penalty because I don't, I don't know, so a certain a certain degree of evidence to do that. Well, if he's got 957 years in prison, I'm not being funny. But. <laughs> Yeah, I think they, they were pretty yeah. damn sure he'd done it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm pretty sure he's not. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, well, it must be the only answer then to that must be he must be indicted in a in a in a in a in a state that didn't do the death penalty or something. Then mm. that's the only thing I can think of. Yeah. We were killed in prison tower and uh, got attacked in the showers by another inmate. He was found alive, but he died in the hospital from a severe head trauma. He just found a murder. Or That's someone wanted to knock him off, but not them off because he obviously knew how many people. It yeah. Is. Um, he also, there was a case where he had um, a ah. situation with a 13 year old boy. They <laughs> don't take kind of um, any, I, I don't, one of those crimes that perhaps will take retribution. Uh, and we hear it in the UK, you know, don't we? We, we hear of that. So, you know, attack the prison, and we're all sitting there thinking, good. <laughs> again it says in your research twice in my superficial the first yeah the first time is literally just slicing his neck off like neck mm. out and um, he did that yeah and then he was then attacked again he wasn't so lucky that time I think you can say I never spoke there isn't a hiding tower that's a new one in America <laughs> <laughs> oh <laughs> <laughs> Next one, at our town. I don't know with the um, episode. Yeah. Yeah. And it it was uh, cannibalism in a chicken factory. Yeah. Is that correct? Okay. And that, <laughs> what a weird one that is. I don't, I don't remember that episode as well. Um, I, I vaguely remember it, to be honest with you. But then, come on, it's years ago, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, but I mean, so <laughs> Yeah, no, I don't remember that one. Um, but apparently, it does say in in the notes that it's a memor mem. What was that word? Memorable. Memorable. Not on camera, isn't it? A chicken. For <laughs> it's not actually. I would just like to point out, everybody, we're not focusing on the cannibalism at a chicken factory. There is a whole other side to it. I haven't quite got there yet. Cannibalism <laughs> in chicken factory. I can't say the other word. Um, the disease thing, wasn't it? It's a disease that people get from ingesting human flesh, and it's actually based on a real condition, um, which is actually quite disgusting. Again, cannibalism is something I don't think I'd ever do. Kiru is a disease that the people of Papua New Guinea are vulnerable to because they practice cannibalism as part of their rituals, their cultural rituals. I love it. It's a transmissible, spongy form, encephalopathy. Oh, go on. <laughs> and the philosophy. And the philosophy. Yeah. That's, that's what you said. <laughs> so, um, when the primate found in humans is ingested, it causes neural symptoms. Interesting, actually, to be fair. Um, the name comes from the word for shaking, which is a hallmark symptom of the disease. Mm-hmm. So, like, you know, having, like a seizure. Yeah, like, well, just like... Okay. Yeah. It is quite rare, everybody. I'd just like to point this out. And if I've, you don't eat human it. flesh, then, then don't worry about it. Um, it's one of those that you shouldn't really yeah, be worried uh, about because you don't live in Papua New Guinea and you don't eat humans, quite frankly. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, what they do is actually eat the brains of dead people as part of a funeral ritual. But this stopped in 1960. 
Kirus, or I will call it Kirus, Kiru disease. Um, can oh, which is mm. it? I think. <laughs> so, although you were eating brooms um, before <laughs> before that time in the nineteen eighties, you could come with this disease and go, "Well, I haven't eaten brooms for like twenty years." Oh well, sorry. you've got problems in it, mate. Uh huh. More the usual thing where you, she's kind of already rotting and stuff like that. Now they're going to catch this Kuru disease as well. Yeah. <laughs> they, they lost a bit. <laughs> now, what I found interesting in this is that it's similar to mad cow disease, <laughs> which is actually called bovine spongiform. I love that word. Spongiform. <laughs> bovine spongiform encephalopathy. Encephalopathy. I'm so glad I'm not reading any of this. I should make a great doctor, wouldn't I? Oh, I <laughs> pronounce anything. You've got, you've got things that could, it's got a really long word, but I'm not going to try and pronounce it really long, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, we know it as mad cow disease. And <laughs> this is why there was such worry, because it's very similar and acts the same way as to why all of a sudden all, pe- all the cows... Yeah, Jordan, tell her to leave it. Jordan. <laughs> yeah, Jordan. <laughs> oh gosh! Oh gosh, Gemma! Fine. We can hear you. Okay. Carry on, anyway. <laughs> okay, mad cat, which is why they withdrew all the beef because if this curu disease was um, was spread, then you know they would have all the beef. Because if this curu, um, you know, can can lay dormant for that amount of time and it incubates that amount of time, they were worried that the mad cow disease would do the same. However, I believe. On tests, they realised that it wasn't so bad after all. Or they're lying to us and we're all going to turn into shaking zombie kind of people in 20 or 30 years. Which everybody's finishing the, w- finishing the show on a positive. Got away from me there. What's happening for next week? Okay, well, next time on a concept show, we are talking quite a serious topic about mental health in the paranormal, aren't we? Yep, and that's next. Week. We have um, the confidential haunting. Um, his name is Ian Varro joining us, and we've also got an act parody joining us, T2000. Uh, he's also part of that paranormal team, and they deal with um, prior cases, and they have actually come up against people with mental health issues. So we're going to be talking about how to help themselves and recognise illnesses and stuff to try and keep us safe as well as the customers, the client, whoever else we can come across. So maybe is what we're going to be talking about next week. Cool. That's going to be a really interesting one, I think. That's going to be fascinating. Now, tomorrow night, we've got Haunted Histories. Um, she is talking filing them from Access Parent regarding Access Balfoury. Um, hopefully, um, if you're there, but if not, they were going to do it. That's interesting to hear. Then on Friday night, we've got Burns Night. The Dark Mirror Show goes live and kicking. And we're talking Haunted Scotland. Scotland. I am like practicing my accent for that show. It's going well. <laughs> Saturday afternoon. Well, I say afternoon. Evening, 6.30 p.m. Carl Hutchinson is in the hot seat for the, the presenter Q&A session on the... Facebook page, the Parasearch Radio Facebook page. Then on Sunday, on my lovely little show, I've got somebody I don't know very well at all coming on. Um, I've got two people I don't know at all. I don't know this guy. He's, he's a bit of a wally. Um, <laughs> 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 no, he's adorable. I adore this man. Um, it's the fantastic Ashley Nib. Thank you. And Sarah Chimisay, um, because they have got a collaboration blog going on called the Supernatural Synchronicity. Um, which is designed to get you all thinking and start interacting and sharing your ideas. So we're talking all about that on Sunday. So we've got loads of fantastic shows still to come. So it's basically a show on banging our heads together. <laughs> what, on Sunday? <laughs> yeah, because that that's what to help progress the paranormal field and say, like, sort it out, let's move right. forward. Well, if, <laughs> if anybody can make us do that, Sarah and Anna, two people that can. I'm going to be listening, absolutely. Got to be done. Yeah. I agree. Dodgy fellow, Ashley, bloke. 
Paris Search Radio. Just so you all know, he will be doing this. We'll be doing a Q and A session as well at some point on the Paris Search Radio group page on Facebook. I, I so think you should do the week after. Watch out for that. <laughs> it's the car, Carl, I think. <laughs> no, thanks to you in the week after, Carl. Oh, okay, the week after that, then. Okay. Week after, week after that. Yeah, okay. Then, <laughs> Eileen. <laughs> Oh, I'm, I'm so going to get out of that. Okay, on that note... Yeah, on that note, it's to thank everybody. Um, I, I want to thank Gemma for doing the studio for me. Fantastic job tonight. First time ever. I think she's done really well. Yeah. Kerry, thank you for joining me. Thank you. No problem. So, from me... Right, from me...